Hello again. This week we have a lot to talk about. Um, I guess I'm starting to get into some end times prophecy because that seems to be what a lot of people are interested in today. I guess with the world going crazy the way it is, uh, it makes gets people to thinking about end times and how things are going to happen. Um, and, you know, we, we can figure out some of that stuff. We're going to learn a lot about that today. There's, there's a lot of preliminary things to learn. Today we're going to look at God's feast days. That's very important for understanding the timeline. And uh, we can also talk about the early and the latter rain and the uh, harvest uh, season in Israel. And uh, because the whole year cycle is based upon Israel and, and uh, God's plan of salvation is based upon that cycle of Israel. Um, or that at least that's how he communicated it to the world. Now, um, before we get into talking about all of that, I guess uh, with me, the end times isn't as important to me as it is, as the more important thing is having a good relationship with God. Because if you have a good relationship with God, then it doesn't quite really matter how the end times are going to go or what exactly is going to happen because if you have God in your life and you are in tune with God then you're going to be in the right place at the right time he's going to be he's going to make sure that you you're in the right place at the right time so you don't have to figure all that out to know where to be and, and what to do. What, what you, the, your first thing to do is to make sure you have a good relationship with God. And what that, that doesn't necessarily mean um, knowing everything about the Bible so much as it does on uh, listening to your heart and saying, well, uh, and having the courage to pray the prayer to say, God, what would you have me do in my life right now? And it might have something to do with uh, stopping some bad behavior, quitting some addiction. Uh, he will let you know. And you have to have the courage to ask that question and be ready for the answer whatever it may be. Sometimes it's a little surprising, but, and then when you do uh, follow that um, answer or that advice, you're rewarded for it. And, and, and then you get the next thing after that. And, and it's just a constant string of um, things that you need to do in your life that comes from your own heart and from God speaking to your own heart and he's very gentle about it and he's very uh, um, authoritative about it and it's for your own good so that is the more important thing to understand about a relationship with God and all the other pieces fall into place after that so it's like Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. So if you're concerned about the end times because you're unsure of salvation, then I just thought I'd sort of put that out there for some people to think about. To, to, it's your own personal heart and God in your heart. Get that right. And you don't have to worry about anything else. And um, so now let's get on with our study. <clears throat> now, before we carry on with this week, I want to just review. Um, I made a few. I, I've been working on this because it kind of stumped me. I did a video on this last week called A Closer Look at Daniel 927. 
And it stumps me a little bit because of this word right here. This one. He intends to desolate. Because that's a very rare verb that I had to look up and figure out. And it was a, a bit of a mind bender uh, to figure this out. So this is what I've come to, the, the translation I've come to of this verse. Now, for this verb here, I have also, last week I showed you a book called um, Jesenius, which is a Hebrew grammar book, and there's also another one. That one is very complicated. It's like a university level grammar book. This one here is a little bit simplified, and more for beginners. Lambdens, Introduction to Biblical Hebrew. This is a good one too on Hebrew grammar. Figuring out how sentences are put together. Now, for this word here that I've been talking about, this poel verb, which is a very rare verb, in, uh, I, I, for people who do look things up in these books, I, I noted in Landon, it's chapter 181, and in Jesenius, it's chapter 55c, talking about the poel verb. And what it describes is a hostile intent, um, usually hostile. Uh, some, sometimes it'll, it'll be something like a seed taking root. It's like an intent to, an intent to establish itself. And, um, or a, an intent to invade, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what this verb, he intends to desolate. So it's, it's, a, it's a verb based upon the word desolate. And it's an intent to desolate. So that was uh, a little difficult to figure that one out. And um, desolate is basically, uh, the main meaning of it is without inhabitant or without any life. And it's uh, used for a destroyed city or for um, maybe like a, a, the... the uh, an area where people used to live, where nobody any longer lives there, and it's desolate. It's just empty. So it's like that kind of a feeling. So it's an emptying of, empty of people, empty of life. Not necessarily destroyed, but it, it goes along with destroyed also. So then, uh, so... That's what I came up with. He shall confirm the covenant to the many for one week, and in the middle of the week he shall bring sacrifice and offering to an end, and upon the edge of false gods or idols. Now that's a, a translated as abominations, and that wor word sort of is is that it is describing that whole system of the false gods like. Jupiter and Mercury and Zeus and all that stuff or any idolatry um, with idols and and following these these uh, ancient religions any any of that and any of the services connected to it is all abominations so and upon the edge of those systems he intends to desolate so this is Jesus, and he's on the edge of those systems, and he intends to, des to, to desolate. So, and until the completion, until this war is over, what is decided shall be poured upon the desolator. Desolations are decided. That's from verse 26. So desolations shall be poured upon the desolator. And the desolator would be the demonic realm, I suppose. The, the ones that are really behind all these false idols and things. So we see, uh, as I made the point last week. I won't worry. So that's just sort of an update on that. That uh, I was just wrestling with that verse a little bit, even after I made the video, to sort out 
exactly what it's talking about. So now let's get on with our video for today and I want to talk about the festivals. Now the festivals it's, it's um, also known to many Christians as the plan of salvation. It's God's plan is in the festivals and you will find the the festivals of ancient Israel were dictated to Israel by God through Moses and you'll find that in Leviticus chapter 23 that whole chapter lays out the festivals and there are seven of them so let's erase this <coughs> So the first festival of the seven is the Sabbath. I'll write that here in the top. That, uh, that is a weekly festival. Every single week there's a Sabbath. And it's Friday at sunset until Saturday at sunset. That is the biblical Sabbath. So uh, you are to rest every week, every Sabbath and not do any work and not do your own things but uh, it's a day for um, getting together with family or praying and um, spiritual rejuvenation so that's the first festival and it kind of permeates into the, all the other festivals so that's one out of the seven now the, the other six festivals there's like a spring, there's like a spring season that has three festivals all joined together and then there's a fall season that has three festivals joined together. So the first festival is the Passover. Okay, so and that happens around the beginning of March usually. And okay and that is um, a commemoration of the uh, coming out of Egypt by the children of Israel when God killed the firstborn of every uh, family in Egypt and the Israelites were to um, sacrifice a lamb and eat it right in the evening between the two evenings so that would mean you know when the sun has gone down but it's still light out and and then it goes dark a little bit a while later that's between the two evenings so they were to eat it then and roast it and they were to put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost and that way the angel of death would pass over their houses and uh, and then uh, it was that was the final plague that caused the Egyptian Pharaoh to send them away out of Egypt with them. and they gave them all their money and all their precious gold and sent them out and so that's the Passover now the Passover also is the day that Jesus Christ was crucified that they they wanted to get rid of him and they said well we can't kill anyone on the Passover so on the Friday they killed him that day they, they crucified him that day and then the that evening was the Passover so they they were kind of in a hurry to get it over with before the Passover so Jesus uh, that Passover lamb signifies Jesus Christ all right so that's the, the, the there's a parody there's a Jewish ancient Israelite um, meaning to this and then there's a Christian meaning to it also so that's also the crucifixion okay then and, and it's about redemption. It's about being redeemed. Now the thing to think about, okay, uh, for a Christian, is the Israelites. When they left Egypt, were they all law-keeping, 
uh, Israelites, were, did they know God all that well? No, they, they didn't know much at all about God. They were just following Moses. And, um, you, you know, we can see from when they got to the Mount Sinai that uh, the, the, when they got the Ten Commandments, that's when they first started to get to know God. And, and then they reverted back to worshiping cows like they did in Egypt. So uh, that was the 40 years in the wilderness was kind of purging them from that. So um, for a Christian, it's the same thing. When you accept Christ in your life, that's a Passover. That's your Passover. So you don't necessarily have to know everything about God. But God is going to lead you into righteousness. He's going to teach you. He's the, he's the Father. He's going to bring you up spiritually. So that's just something to think about with the Passover. Okay, then um, there's the days of unleavened bread. The, the, the Passover is another Sabbath. The Passover is a Sabbath day. No matter what day it falls upon. Um, now that falls upon the 15th day of the first month. And the way it worked in ancient times was the first bud of spring would, the, would count the first. After the first bud, the next new moon would be the first day of the year. And then the 15th day of the year of the first month that was the Passover now that was the Sabbath no matter what day it fell upon even though every Saturday is a Sabbath um, now the second the, the, the right after the Passover there's a seven day festival and it's the seven days of unleavened bread and what you would what they would do and what they still do Jews is uh, they'll they'll get all the leaven any kind of yeast or there's a whole list of leaven things in your kitchen or in your house and any leaven has to be removed from your house so they would have the Passover is the deadline to get all the leaven out so they would have all the leaven out before the Passover comes, because on the Sabbath you can't do you can't do all that stuff. You have to be ready before that. So, um, so the very next day would be the days of unleavened bread, the seven days. And at the last day, oh oh wait a minute, the second day of of, of, of unleavened bread is the day of first fruits. Okay. So we've got the days of unleavened bread. That would be right after the Passover for seven days. Okay? And that's the days of unleavened bread. Okay, I'll just write it short. Days of unleavened. And the second day of unleavened bread, which would be the third day after the Passover, that was the day when they would start to count the days to the next holy day. And they would count 49 days. Now this is interesting if you're thinking about Daniel chapter 9. Seven sevens. Seven, seven sabbaths. So from the second day, second day of unleavened bread, which would be the third day after the Passover, they would have the, that would be called the day of first fruits. Okay? The second day of unleavened bread. Third day. So what day is that? That would be the day of the resurrection of Jesus. Right? It's the day of first fruits. And they would wave their first fruits of their harvest. In the ancient times in the temple they would wave the first fruits of their harvest before the Lord and offer him the first fruits as a thank you for bringing the weather 
and for making the harvest happen. Now, from, the, from that second day, they would count 49 days. And then the next festival was called Shavuot. The day of Shavuot. And what that is, is uh, the Feast of Weeks. That would be another Sabbath. Now the Jews are like, we don't know why the God told us to do this, but this is what we do because he told us to. So after 49 days, there's the day of Shavuot, and it's another Sabbath day. And it's the festival of weeks because they counted the seven weeks, you see. Festival of weeks. So there's three, three festivals here, the Passover, the Days of Unleavened Bread, and the Festival of Weeks. These are the three spring festivals. Now, after the Festival of Weeks, okay, here it is, Shavuot. And what happened on, the, on that day in the New Testament? You'll find it in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. Let's, uh, so from the second day of unleavened bread, okay, they count down. They count the 49 days to the festival of weeks, and that's Pentecost. That's the day of Pentecost. And that's when the apostles, in Acts chapter 2, the apostles received the Holy Spirit. They had the fiery tongues come down on them, and they were gathered, because that is a Sabbath day. They were gathered in the upper room on the Sabbath day together, and they received the Holy Spirit. So, uh, and the Spirit's given to the apostles. Now, for the Jews, this day is a festival of when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. You see, there's the Passover, where they left Egypt, and seven weeks later, they were at Mount Sinai receiving the law. With Jesus, he was crucified on the Passover, and seven weeks le later, the apostles received the Holy Spirit. Okay? So now we're going to look at the, f the uh, fall festivals. There's three fall festivals. So three spring festivals, and three fall festivals, and the Sabbath. That makes seven festivals. Okay. So now, in uh, September to October... Because these festivals go by the moon, right? So it doesn't fall exactly on the same calendar day of our Julian cal calendar every year. So they, they kind of travel, they go, they, they'll they be late September, early October. That and Around that time is when this festival will fall on the new moon. Okay, so... so Yom Teruah, and that is the Festival of Trumpets. Okay, now this festival is the blowing of the trumpets. The first day of the festival, it's, a, it's ten days, okay? It's a ten-day festival, or, or they count ten days. And uh, the first day of the festival is the Sabbath. Okay, the first day of the festival is the Sabbath, where they blow the trumpets. And it's a ram's horn, so far. It's called a so far. It's, you know, the emptied ram's horn. That's their, they would blow their trumpets. And it was also a Sabbath day. And there was a special offering 
okay? And then on the 10th day of that month, so 10 days later, now during these 10 days, okay, the blowing of the trumpet was to begin the festival, right? So that's the festival of trumpets. It's to get everybody's attention. Say, listen everybody. Bring your hearts to, to God. And you have 10 days before the next festival. So it's like an announcement of the big festival coming. And what they would do would be to pray and fast and get ready for the coming festival in 10 days. Okay? So there's 10 days. And the Day of Atonement is the day when the high priest goes into the most holy room in the temple and offers up an offering to God and that's for the sins of all the people. You see, all year people would bring a sacrifice to the temple for their sins, right? So a family or a, anyone who sinned would bring a sacrifice to the temple to atone for their sin and the priest would offer it in the temple and that would happen all year. But the Day of Atonement, that is a sacrifice for the nation of Israel. It's, for, it's a group sacrifice for all the sins of the people. And that, that is when the, the people as a country were cleansed and made holy. They were become the holy people of God. And that happened every year at this time. So that was 10 days after the blowing of the trumpet. Right? And uh, today they, they have uh, usually a 25 hour fast on, uh, during this time. And, uh, and then the, uh, there would be, after the Day of Atonement, they would count five days. And that would begin the Festival of Tabernacles, booths. Or the Hebrew word for a booth, Sakot. Sakot, that's what they call it. Festival of Sukkot, or Festival of Booths. And what they would do, or what they do on this festival, on the first day of the festival, they all gather boughs and branches, and, and they, they make a booth out in the street, or outside, and they, they sit in that booth for seven days, rejoicing. Rejoicing about the atonement. Because if the sacrifice was accepted, then that would be a great time of a, a flat, that would be a great time of rejoicing, and um, then that's what the festival of booths was about. Every man in his own booth would rejoice. Okay, so this is the the basic mo, uh, Torah festivals of the nation of Israel. Now these days, as you can see, are connected to this, this, these spring festivals here are connected very much to the New Testament church. Uh, the Passover is the crucifixion. The resurrection of Christ is the second day of unleavened bread. And the uh, day of Pentecost. Now I have a verse here that we can read. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, let me turn to it, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. That means no, no puffiness, no yeast blowing things up, right? Yeast makes the bread rise. No rising, just solid bread. 
you got to be solid. Okay? So purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, and as you are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see? So, so Paul is using these festivals to explain the gospel of Christ to us. And what the unleavened means is unleavened bread is sincerity and truth. It's solid. It isn't risen. It isn't blown up like other bread. It's just, it is what it is, and it's solid, straightforward, okay? So, um, now in the, the, I don't think we need to read, if you want to read yourself, you can take a look at Acts chapter 2 to see when the apostles uh, received the uh, Holy Spirit, and that was on the day of Pentecost. That's 49 days at, that's the end of the Feast of Weeks, 49 days after the second day of Unleavened Bread. So it's 49 days after the Resurrection, where that's where they were. Now the first fruits, we'll get into that a little bit more, when we're going to look at the harvest times of Israel. Okay, let me make a little bit of room here. I don't need to. I've got room down here. That's enough there to get an idea. Now with the agriculture, um, there's the there's an early rain and a latter rain. Okay, so from um, it rains. There's an early rain is is from October to November. Okay. So what do we got here? We got September, October, 10 days, 15 days, and 7 days. So it's 20-something uh, days. So by now we're in the end of October. So after this is all done, that's when the early rain starts. And the early rain is sort of the, comes in the fall time, and it's the beginning of winter, and it's, it's a, uh, what that rain does is it breaks up the ground. The, the ground has been dry all summer because from May to September it's dry and hot. So we go about here. Uh, we got up about after the Feast of Weeks over. We got about May and then up until September. Before Between these two festivals May to September, it's dry and hot summer, okay? So that's between the two sets of festivals. Now, in the, in the last part, the latter rain comes, or the early rain comes, I mean. So in the, sec in the fall time, the early rain starts. And then it's not a time for planting because it's getting colder. But what the early rain does is it breaks up the uh, ground and it makes the ground softer because it's been hardened from the summertime. Okay, then the latter rain, then the, then the ground will sit and between November and December, so after, after the uh, early rain, November to December is a time of seed. They, they start planting seed. And what they would do is they would, they would plant barley and flax. And they would plant it sporadically. Like, you would plant, for four months they would plant. And they would plant barley, flax, barley, flax. And they would scatter the plantings so that the harvest would also be scattered, so that it wouldn't all ripen at one time. They would plant enough that they could harvest, 
and then by the time they're done harvesting the next crop would be ready by the time they're done harvesting the next crop would be ready they would do it like that so they planted for four months and then then would come the latter rain okay in the springtime and the latter rain comes between March and April March to April that's from here right the latter rain now the latter rain is a much heavier rain and if there's no early rain and the ground isn't broken up the latter rain will cause floods so you see that's what that's the importance of this festival is the atonement brings the early rain because if you don't have an early rain you're gonna have a flood and you're not gonna have a harvest and what's a flood that's like judgment day like the flood of Noah Noah so this is all to avoid the flood right okay so then the latter rain comes and then they start um, during the latter rain and they're doing their planting okay then when the the bar the first barley ripens for the first fruits that's the first fruits to god they offer to god the first fruits during the uh, festival of weeks on the second day of the unleavened day of unleavened bread that's when they offer the first fruits of barley that was brought in from the latter rain Okay, then, um, and then in the, and then that's it. That's how it works. And then the, the other crops they would plant along here that would go on into summer, right? But then, in the end of the year, they would have the harvest of their other crops, and all the tallying would be done before the Day of Atonement because the Day of Atonement their storehouses would be full and they would be ready to go through the winter and then through the winter they would run run through their storehouses and then get ready for the latter rain in the spring where they would begin planting again so that was like the all tied in with the blessings of God and the harvest. So when we start talking about um, a rapture, pre-trib, post-trib, when does it all happen and all this confusion, nobody's talking about this and this is very important because this was Jesus. This is Jesus and the Apostles. This is the Judgment Day. This is the early rain. And uh, there's another verse I'll read here. Joel chapter 2 verse 23. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And that's the month when the barley will harvest and everything will work out according to the way it's supposed to. And see, it says the former rain moderately. Because if it doesn't come moderately, it's going to be a flood. And I will re and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. So, um, this is very, very important. If we're going to study God's plan, which includes the end times, then we have to look at uh, God's plan of 
seasons. This is the God cycle of Jesus often talked about the harvest is the people of God. He's harvest he's harvesting the people of God. And and Jesus is the first fruits at that time when he was crucified. He's the first fruits. And it says also many graves were opened at that time, other graves of uh, Israelites. And that was the first fruits of the harvest for God. So naturally the harvest for God in the fall time will be the harvest of the, the great harvest of the uh, end times. So we'll talk about this more in our next videos but I wanted to just bring this to your attention. It's very important to understand the harvest season the early and latter rain and the harvest festivals. These are all harvest festivals. Now in modern Israel they start their new year right here. And that practice started during the Babylonian captivity in ancient times. And I guess it just makes more sense because it's the end of the hot season beginning of the early rain. So, but God starts it here in the spring with the first bud of spring. And this here shows God's plan for the entire world. This is the, the sowing time and the harvest time. So if we're going to look at uh, timelines uh, from prophecy, it's very much connected to this this situation here. The other thing that we want to look at is in Joshua chapter 6. If we're looking at the book of Revelation it seems to be very much in tuned like Joshua chapter 6 which is the time when the, the fall of uh, the fall of Jericho they marched around the city with trumpets and with the ark once a day for seven days. But on the seventh day they marched around it seven times, blowing the trumpets. And each day they marched around once, blowing the trumpets, or the ram's horn, the shofar. And then on the seventh day, seven times. And that's very much the, 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 the pattern of the book of Revelation. So now we'll, we'll see some um, preachers now, they'll be pointing out, see the book of Revelation is not, um, the book of Revelation is not a linear book. It doesn't start at the beginning and go through a story to the end. That's the way English books are today, but it's not the way the ancient Hebrews are. Uh, they'll do this, they'll tell a story, they'll give the basics of the story, and then they'll give a long detail of it. And then they'll go to another story, and then they'll give the basics and perhaps a long detail of a part of that story. And then they'll give another story, and then, and then, and then they'll tell the same story again from a different perspective. And then the same story again from a different perspective. And that seems to be the pattern of revelation. It kind of does that kind of thing. And preachers will say, well, first this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So they're all over the place on the timeline. And, and they just frankly just have it wrong. So revelation, you have to be careful with that book. Because it's very much like this. And it's like the Joshua... Uh, chapter 6, which is Joshua is the same name as Jesus, Yeshua. It's the book of Yeshua. Okay, so it'll be like they marched around it. They marched around the city once a day for seven days, right? And on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. It's the same kind of pattern, like Hebrew pattern.
So we'll get into that soon enough. So uh, I thank you for watching and um, have a good week. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe and smash that like button. It helps a lot. Thank you very much.